Okay, today is Mr. Cordell. He comes to us uh, from uh, China. He was a graduate of Notre Dame, actually graduated from an MBA program here. And I want to make sure I've got, a, I've got a few facts here. I want to make sure I get all these facts straight. Uh, he's been with BMW since 1996. To do that, after he graduated from his MBA program, he learned German. So he, he took so a foreign language came pay off big dividends. He was instrumental in developing BMW's remarketing used car strategy in Germany. Set the industry standing standard for managing lease portfolios and resale values. And BMW has won a n numerous industry awards for that value retention. He is the youngest CEO in the BMW Group. He's currently the managing director and CEO of BMW Group Financial Services China, a 92 grad of Hillsdale College, and as I said, an MBA grad from here from 1996. So for, uh, I know we have a few MBAs in here, so he was in your seat not that long ago. In fact, he just reminded me, he was in the first class that graduated from this building. We built this building, uh, we moved into it in 95. Okay, with that, Mr. Cordell. Well, Grüß Gott, Ni Hao, how about good afternoon? That rolls off the tongue a little bit easier. Uh, very happy to be with you today. It's an honor and a pleasure. Um, like Sam said, I was in your, in your seats not all that long ago, and uh, I still remember the guys that came through here. So uh, when I got the call about coming to speak, I said I'd really love to. Uh, still have family in the area, and it's always good to come home. So... Today we're going to take you through uh, some of the things um, as far as an overview of everything you need to know to succeed in international business you learn from the Wizard of Oz. So we're going to have a little bit of fun with it and uh, hopefully something that you remember. I've been with BMW 14 years now and over seven of those years I've worked internationally. I've done two tours through Munich and I've been in Beijing for about two and a half years and hopefully just share some insights with you. Uh, some personal experiences, and uh, also go through a little bit of the Chinese auto market uh, because it is one of the most dynamic markets in the world right now. As far as the agenda, go through a little bit of the personal background, but also go through why China, why international business, why is it important. Um, and then we're going to get into the, the three themes, really, how to succeed. It takes some courage, it takes a brain, it takes heart, and then a few other things, a few miscellaneous things at the end. As far as my background, I would really say it's kind of like Green Acres and the Dukes of Hazard has collided with Hogan's Heroes and Hong Kong Fui. Um, my background, why Green Acres? I'm a local boy. I grew up here in Mishawaka, went to Marion High School. And, uh, you know, when I first started at Notre Dame in the MBA program, they said, oh, where are you from? I said, well, I'm a townie. They said, oh, you're the guy that used to come steal bikes on campus, huh? I said, well... Not really. Uh, as far as the Dukes of Hazard, I spent four years growing up in South Georgia, a little town called Moultrie. And that was one of my experiences as far as moving to other areas and experiencing different parts of the country. Uh, Hogan's Heroes, I've done two tours through Munich um, from 97 to 99, and then from 2005 to 2008, Hong Kong Fui. I'm responsible for China and Hong Kong markets. And I've been there since the beginning of 2008. Why China? Why is it important? BMW remains the leading premium luxury automaker as far as sales. Uh, year to date through July, we're at 814,000 units worldwide. That's BMW and Mini combined. And China made a huge contribution to the success. If you look at Mercedes and Smart, they're at 713,000. If you look at Audi, they're at about 646,000. Why China? China is now the second in the world as far as GDP, replacing Japan this year, and continues to grow at a remarkable rate. As far as GDP growth, you know, we're hoping to eke out a positive GDP this year. Well, China, in the worst part of the crisis was at 8% growth. 
and is continuing and accelerating forward again. Uh, the long-term outlook remains very solid. Inflation has been kept under control. So they're doing a very good job from a macroeconomic standpoint. High growth, a lot of opportunity. It's creating a lot of wealth over there, and they've kept inflation in check. During the financial crisis, you know, I would say they uh, did a very good job. Their banking system was still healthy. So when they did a stimulus package, it actually worked. And that's the main difference with the West at this point in time. Our banking system was broken. As far as the overall auto market, these are the growth patterns in passenger vehicle sales. This is not total light vehicle. This is only passenger. If you look at 2009, Overall, passenger vehicle market grew by 53%. That is astounding growth year over year. The luxury market, which we refer to as the plus segment, grew 30%. And our share in the, uh, the overall plus segment grew within that. Last year, we grew 38% year over year, so we grew faster than the overall luxury segment. Most of the growth in 2009 was in the smaller car segment. Part of that was government policy driven. They instituted a tax credit for any vehicles with a 1.6 liter engine and smaller. Most of those vehicles are domestically produced. It really drove the small car market. This year, what you've seen is kind of the exact opposite. The overall passenger vehicle market has grown 33%. The luxury segment, year over year, has grown 90%. There is no other market in the world where this is happening. BMW overall grew, has grown 98% year over year this year. When I first joined BMW in the United States back in 96, we were selling about 92,000 vehicles. We have sold almost that many through July in China this year, just to give you some perspective. The growth rates there are amazing. Uh, overall, Mini grew 166% year over year and BMW 94%. The biggest constraint we have at this point is we don't have enough local production. As far as becoming a major engine for luxury segment sales, you can see the red part of this pie is the luxury segment and how it keeps growing each year. Uh, China is in the red, the rest of the world in blue. It keeps expanding this year. It'll probably be about 10% of the overall market. We talked before about GDP and growth, inflation under control. This is part of the, the contributing factors. Um, but you've got a customer base that is very aspirational. It's getting more wealth. We're in a very good position. There's been some product price competition, uh, but also we're going more into locally produced models, and that affects the pricing as well. There's a 25% import tax on all vehicles imported. So if you can produce locally, you get a price advantage. Soft factors, it's really, okay, Volkswagen was one of the first entries into the market. People have had those. Now they're aspiring to something a little bit more than that. This chart I did not translate, I realize. So if anybody's fluent in German, you can speak up and translate for all of us. Uh, but what it's saying is that this is China's place in the overall BMW market. In 2004, China was the 11th largest market for BMW. In 2008, it was the fifth largest market globally for BMW. In 2010, it just replaced the UK as the third largest market for BMW in the world. By 2020, we are expecting it to be the largest market globally for BMW, and that is a very big achievement. The models, if you want to take a look at these, it's the largest market for the 7 Series. It's the largest market for the X6. It's the largest market for the 5 Series. It's the second biggest market for the X5, for the X3, and for the 3 Series. Now, part of that is attributable to doing some custom things locally. This car is called the 5 Series Li. It is only made in China. It is only sold in China. So we took the basic 5 Series, which is a fantastic product, but we stretched it. And China is very much a driver's market as far as people having chauffeurs. This product hit the market dead on. It stretched. 
so that the back seat, you get more leg room and it's optioned up more. You can get a refrigerator that runs through the back seat. You can get separate DVD screens in the back, separate heating and ventilation controls, separate entertainment controls. It's a beautiful and wonderful car. When we first did this car with the last generation of 5 Series, we took the existing 5 Series and stretched it. This car was built from the initial drawing board as a long wheelbase. And this car has promoted a lot of our success in the market, but I think it's a very good example of taking something on a global basis and tailoring it to the local market, which is part of how you succeed in international business as well. These charts should jolt you out of your seat. In 2008, the U.S. was the largest car market in the world for light vehicle sales, 13.2 million, compared to China's 9.3. In 2009, China became the largest light vehicle market in the world. And the way the growth rates are going, I don't think there's ever any going back. Now, the U.S. is very much down. When we did valuations in the past, peak was about 16 to 17 million vehicles, the trough about 12 million, and the U.S. sunk below that. Uh, but what you see now is an ever-increasing Demand, if you look at 2009 to 2010, the forecast this year is for sales of 15.6 million vehicles in the market versus 11.5 for the U.S. As far as GDP growth, we talked about that a little bit before, but the growth in the GDP per capita is still below what you would see in the West, which means there's still a lot of room for growth in this market. Now... Moving on to succeeding in international business. We're going to start with the brain. If I only had a brain, the scarecrow. Um, everything you need to know about success has already been written. It's out there. There are new, I, I would call it old wine and new bottles that come out. Uh, but anything that you need to know about it has already been written. And some of the books are well time tested. And I would highly recommend that you seek them out and, and really take the, take the lessons to heart. The biggest thing, I think, is to think hard about your goals and write them down. It's a very powerful thing. If you have to sit down and articulate what it is that you want to achieve in the coming years, it becomes very concrete. Um, and when you have to put it to paper, you have to articulate it a little bit better, but also it becomes a more solid and established goal. You would be surprised at the amount of things that you write down that you actually achieve over time, rather than just thinking about it as a daydream. The other thing to think about is, how does an international assignment fit with your goals once you've written them down? I'm in the auto industry. In the auto industry, getting an international assignment is like getting your ticket punched for moving on to the higher levels. I would say I was an accidental international business person. Um, when I was at Notre Dame and coming out of school, I had done the Wall Street interviews, I had done interviews with General Motors and Ford, and I had offers from both of them. Um, my real passion, what I love, is cars, and I decided to go with BMW. My entrance into getting an international assignment was, I would say, accidental. Um, the CFO from Munich was over in the U.S. I met him a few times. Uh, and he was a pretty intimidating guy. He was probably about 6'4", six, 6'5", six, bald with a goatee and, and pretty buff, and his name was Johan, but... Uh, we hit it off, and he, he came to me one day, and he said, listen, Kirk, um, you know, you seem like a pretty good guy. You know, I'd be willing to bring you over to Munich for three months to work in my group, but I can't promise you anything on the backside. I can't promise you a return to the U.S. It's a very high-risk situation. But looking at it and how highly coveted international assignments are in the auto industry, I jumped at it. I didn't know German. I'd never even been to Germany. And so I got a one-way ticket over to Munich back in uh, October of 2007, and that three-month assignment turned into two years. And uh, it was a fantastic experience. But how you get an international assignment is really through relationships and through people. Um, it can be one of the most rewarding things you've ever done, but it also can be one of the toughest things you've ever done as well. I think regardless of whether you want to work internationally or whether you want to work domestically, what is important is that you need to have an understanding of how the global markets are working and what's happening on a global basis because business is becoming so interlinked 
that you need to know what's happening in the other markets. If you look at China right now and what's happening there, and you're working in the US, what you see is manufacturers are diverting production to China because the sales rates are so high, the growth rates are so high, and they're devoting more R&D to the Chinese market to custom tailor things to that market. As far as learning and being very open, you have to be like a sponge. Um, you have to be very open to new ideas. You know, one of the things that uh, I did as an undergrad was I was a philosophy minor, and I think it's really helped me. Um, you get the facts and the finite knowledge. I was a finance major, did an MBA, but the philosophy really helped as far as create, creative thinking and being open to other ideas. So if you have a little bit of a different background, I wouldn't say, you know, it shouldn't scare you off from business, and in fact, it can be an advantage at times. Um, there are situations that we've faced where coming up and making something out of nothing can be your trademark. Um, you know, with the Chinese market, and especially on the financing side, there are a lot of regulations, there are funding restrictions, uh, but I have to say, the deal that we've been working on uh, over the last 15 months is probably the most exciting thing I've worked on in my career. This is as exciting as finance can be, right? Um, but it is something that was way out of the box. It took a lot of time to get done with the local bank and some local funders. Um, it's up for approval right now. But I have to say, if we can bring this product to market, we will be able to beat our competition in the market by several hundred basis points as far as a pricing mechanism. And for funding and in finance, that's a very big deal, especially for our dealers and for our customers. So getting into some of those creative backgrounds, whether it's philosophy or a different uh, minor or major, those things can really help you because creative thinking is what can separate you from other people in coming up with creative solutions. The never stop learning portion, I have to say, when you're on an international assignment, you have to use your problem solving skills every day. Um, you will face problems on a daily life basis that Life here is very normal, you know the lay of the land, but when you get into a foreign country, you don't know the rules all the time. So you have to be very open, you have to pay attention to what's going on around you, and there are times where you have to use your problem solving skills as far as how to just get daily things done. And that can make life a little bit more difficult, but it can also be very rewarding and enriching. As far as courage and the cowardly lion, what part does courage play in life? Um, I think confidence is everything. You know, you have to find your mojo. We'll go back to the old Austin Powers movie. You know, you don't want Dr. Evil to steal your mojo because you're going to be dead. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's personal relationships, if it's sports, or if it's business. Confidence is everything. Uh, there is a fine line between confidence and arrogance, and you do not want to cross it. But you need to have the confidence in yourself and in your abilities to get things done. You know, when I first came to Notre Dame, I was sitting in orientation on the first day, and everybody had to go around and talk a little bit about their background. And the guy next to me, we get to the guy next to me, and, oh, you know, I went to Princeton, I played football, and I worked on Wall Street for three years. And I sat back and I thought, holy shit, am I screwed. Um, and the fact of the matter is, you know what, I ended up graduating third in my class. Um, but you have to have the confidence to get through it. And don't let anybody steal your confidence. There's actually a very good book out right now called uh, Mojo. And I would recommend reading it. But it really goes through the whole confidence piece, gaining your confidence, establishing your confidence, and not losing your confidence. Uh, I will say about international assignments, it sounds very glamorous, right? Oh, wow, you're in Munich, you're doing business in Spain, you're doing business here. I got to tell you, the glamour stops when you walk off the plane and you can't read simple street signs. And that's the situation I was in. You know, I was on the way from the airport and I saw these signs that said Ausfahrt. And I'm like, well, I've never heard of that city. It must be pretty big. Well, it's German for exit, so. Um, but you're there to work. Uh, and you're there to contribute. It's not a vacation wherever you're going. I worked longer hours, and I worked harder on an international assignment than I did domestically. And the reason is, it just takes longer to get things done. 
Um, you know, I was spending two days a week in the morning at 7.30 in German grammar classes, and then I spent my Saturdays in vocabulary classes. You know, this is not the way you want to spend your weekends, um, but it, it helped quite a bit. I became fluent in the language, uh, it gained the respect of the people there, and quite honestly, if you want to integrate into the society, and especially because I'm working for a German company, it was absolutely necessary. Um, you know, now when I'm in China and I'm in senior management meetings, if there are no local people present, it switches to German. Uh, so it's been a very big benefit to me. If you can learn a foreign language in university, I got to tell you, it's a lot easier than trying to do it when you're out in the real world and working. Um, you know, I would say, you know, you're just on an international assignment, you're just a little bit, I don't, I don't know if slower is the right word, but it takes you longer to learn the lay of the land and to learn how to get things done and to get things done. And you are going to work a lot of hours. Um, the weekends are fun when you can get the free weekends, but the biggest thing to remember is you're there to produce. It's not a vacation. Um, attitude, your attitude is going to be very important. Okay, You have to adopt a very open attitude. It's not right or wrong. It's just different. And if you can adopt that attitude in a foreign environment, you will succeed. But as soon as you start judging other societies and their cultures and their traditions, you're going to sink. Um, I have to say that in Germany, I've been yelled at more in public than I would care to admit because I was crossing streets when the little light was red. And in New York, I did that all the time. In Germany, you do not do that. You follow the rules. Um, I have been yelled at in grocery stores and other places. Uh, you know, I was just stepping out of line. I didn't know it, but that was the matter of the fact. But you don't judge it. You just adopt and adapt and, and move on. Um, the other thing to remember is don't forget your moral compass. You know, there are situations that you will find yourself in where you can be compromised. And it's not like the HR training video that flashes, you know, this is harassment or this is a bribe, do not take it. Um, you're going to be faced with these real world examples. And probably the best advice I ever received from somebody was an old mentor who said, listen, if you would feel embarrassed telling your family or friends about what you did, then you probably shouldn't be doing it. And I have to say, it was a lesson that has served me very well because there are things that will come along and temptations that will come along and you just have to pass on them and you don't want to get caught up in those situations. And those situations, believe me, will present themselves at times. Now, if you can keep your moral compass, you will keep the respect of the people that you're working with in that foreign environment and that's pretty big because if you lose the respect of those people, you're going to be in a very bad situation and very ineffective. Hazing. It's not just for college anymore. You are going to be tried and tested in different ways. I arrived in Munich and I uh, had my, you know, my freshly minted MBA diploma. It was all very nice. And I got stuck in housing, company housing, that was probably made my college dorm room look like a palace. It was absolutely awful. I couldn't believe it. But it was a test. They were testing to see how bad do you really want to be here? How bad do you want to work here? What are you willing to pull up with? How hungry are you? So I stuck it out over time, and I did fine. But there are going to be those instances where you show up, they put you in a situation that you don't really appreciate or like, but you got to suck it up and do it. Um, you know, I also have had other situations like that, but part of it is a test. They're testing you. They want to see how hungry you are how badly you really want it. And that will go on probably throughout your career in different forms and different functions. You know, if they're looking for a volunteer to stay late and get something done, you want to put your hand up and you want to go do it. Um, you know, there are times where things come up where somebody mentions something. You go use your own time, come up with some conclusions or some uh, ideas on it, and it makes a lot of sense. When I was in Munich the first time, uh, BMW was joined up with the Rover Group at that time, which included Land Rover and MG and Rover Cars. And if you want to talk about a uh, case study and culture fits between countries and companies, it was very interesting at the time. 
So the number two guy in BMW was going over to England to meet with Rover people, and they needed a native speech writer, and the speeches he was getting, he wasn't happy with. So I took my own time, kind of heard what he was talking about, wrote up some speeches, and put them in front of him. That type of thing led to the fact that I started doing his presentations and speeches for him. So whenever he had to do something in English, I was flying around on the BMW jet with him, prepping him on all of these things, and would fly home with him as well. But it got me exposure to a lot of senior executives. It got me the trust of people, and those types of things pay off down the line. You know, the biggest thing you want is people to become comfortable with you. They want to know, and especially, I'm a foreigner working in a German company, and they want to know, all right, that's Kirk. I know Kirk. I trust him. I don't think he's going to do anything really stupid, um, and I know he's going to get some results done. Um, so no matter what business you go into, you know, probably at some point you're going to have to do a stint, if you're in a large corporate environment, through corporate headquarters, and it's very much for that reason. People are going to want to take a sniff and see who you are and what you're about and see whether they can trust you or not. And that trust plays a very big part of business. Not only in your own career, in that career development, but in the relationships in international business. And that really takes us on to the next topic, which is the heart piece. Do what you love. Passion shows, okay? I am a car geek. I have been a car geek ever since I've been this tall. I absolutely love cars. I go to car shows and car races because I love to, not because I have to. And if you're able to mix one of your passions with a professional career, I got to tell you, it can be extremely satisfying. There are times where I honestly sit back, and please don't tell anybody at BMW this, but there are times where I sit back and I go, wow, I can't believe I'm getting paid for this. This is pretty cool. Um, we were talking earlier, you know, the new 5 Series just came out, and in March we took all of the Chinese dealers to Portugal for three days, and we rented out one of the old F1 racetracks there and had track days with the cars. The pits were set up as classrooms for product knowledge, and they really did a nice job. Uh, each classroom was devoted to a different aspect of the car. And the most fun of it was getting on the track with these cars. So we would drive the 5 Series, the E-Class, the Audi A6, put them up against each other. And for me, I was like a kid in a candy store. I was like, this is great. I get to do this for three days, and I'm getting paid. This is fantastic. Um, but if you can combine your passion with a professional career, it makes a big, big difference. Um, and, you know, I, I don't care how good your job is. There are days that are, gonna, that are not going to be so great, uh, but there are days that are going to be fantastic, and that's just the nature of work. But if you can combine something that you really love with a career, i got to tell you, the hours don't matter as much. What you have to go to doesn't matter as much. I still get excited when I get a new car, and I get a new car about every six months, you know. This is, this is something that I just absolutely love. Um, there used to be a car company here in South Bend that made a specialty car called the Avanti. I used to go sit for hours over at that factory and just watch them being built. And, uh, you know, it's something that just carried on through today. Your ability to connect with people is everything. International business, you know, I would say U.S. business, we're very much focused on our Blackberries, hammering out emails, uh, maybe doing some phone calls. International business is a much different environment. You are going to have to do more face-to-face -face meetings because you come from a different culture. There's not an immediate connection or a sense of trust, and you have to spend more time with people. If I were to take my European experiences, you know, there were times in Spain where I came back from lunch at 5.30 in the afternoon, and let me tell you, it was after a couple bottles of Ribera del Duro as well. So, and that's a different cultural aspect. But people want to get to know you on a personal basis before they do business with you. In China, I spend a lot more time on airplanes going to visit people. Um, you know, there's times where you could maybe do a phone call, you can maybe do an email. But I have to say, when you're crossing cultural lines, to me, there's just too much of a chance that 
the message isn't going to come across exactly correctly. Even in English, between native speakers, emails can have very different meanings depending on how you're reading it or actually what mood you're in when you're reading this email. Now, take that across cultural lines, and that difference gets even bigger. The amount of time that you will have to invest in these relationships is very big. Your ability to get along with people is everything, and that is something you honestly do not learn in a classroom. And it's a skill that you have to hone and develop and get across and get through. You know, I will say that in Europe and in China, alcohol plays a part in business. In the U.S., you would get fired for it. But in these environments, it's very much a social aspect of that interaction. The other piece of it is they believe that when they have you out drinking that your real personality is going to come through. And if you have any ill intentions, that it's going to come out. Um, so you have to be able to go out and do these things and also go to these different dinners and just invest a lot of time in relationships. I have to say, I have eaten more different things than I would care to admit, but I've survived. You know, I've been at dinners where I'm the guest of honor and I get the pig's ear. Uh, I've eaten chicken's feet, I've eaten duck tongue, and you know what, I survived it all. But as the honored guest at some of these dinners, you look at it and you think, oh my God. Um, but you have to take it into the cultural aspect of, it's an honor in their environment, you go along with it, and I have to say, I have met some fantastic people. The nonverbal communication is very important. I have to say that in a foreign language, and I think this goes for other people as well, I'm a much better listener. You know why? I pay more attention to body language. I pay more attention to how the people are reacting, how they're shifting in their seat, what they're doing, because I may not understand every word that they're saying. And that body language and that nonverbal communication becomes extremely important. And the personal contact, as we spoke before, is vital. The local traditions, customs, and people, you know what? You're a guest over there. Whatever country you're doing business in, you are a guest, which means you need to be on your best behavior. The best way I think I can describe this, and this is a very simple example, is that it's like being a little kid and going and playing at your buddy's house. You don't take the best toys. You're on your best behavior because you know what? If you're not, the parents may get pissed and send you home. So you need to keep that in mind, and you need to respect what's going on. Knowing people as individuals, you have to get to know them. Uh, you have to invest the time. The guest part, best behavior. I think the other part is you have to negotiate with a long-term and fair perspective. I have to say the time horizon in China is very long. And you have to invest the time for a win-win relationship. If you try to take advantage of somebody, you might get away with it for a year or two, but it's going to come back to haunt you. And you do not do those types of things. Organizational development. This is one area that probably in school we didn't cover as much. And I have to say in the business world, we've spent a lot of time on it. Uh, when I went into China, we spent a lot of time developing our organization, and it's certain things. Um, you know, we instituted a uh, program called Lunch and Learn. We were in an all-associate meeting. We introduced a new product, and I was getting a lot of blank stares back. And I said, all right, well, how do we get people interested in this? How do we get them educated in it a little bit? But don't want to make it mandatory. So we came up with this idea called Lunch and Learn, where we brought lunch in for people, free lunch, and during that time, there was a presentation, we gave an update on something, and this item happened to be on a new product. I have to say, it's been so successful that other countries within the Asia Pacific region have adopted it, and the first one was Australia. But it was just an idea that grew as far as how do you train and grow your people, it's a very simple thing. Uh, but interesting story, a side story to that is I asked my assistant, I said, all right, well, what can we order? What type of food can we order to get everybody to come to this meeting? She looked at me and she goes, KFC. And I thought, you have to be kidding me. We ordered KFC. Everybody in the company came and attended. I was absolutely amazed. <laughs> KFC has done a fantastic job in China. They are probably 
outnumber McDonald's three to one as far as stores that are open. And they've been very good at taking a global concept and tailoring it to the local market. Uh, other things that we've done from an organizational development standpoint, uh, we've changed our bonus compensation system. It used to be very subjective. Part of it, honestly, was probably based on how well your boss liked you or not. Um, and we went to a different part. We went to a balanced scorecard approach. And it seems very simple. But to try to get everybody in the organization to understand what a balanced scorecard is and how it works was a big step. But now that we've been through a year and a half or two years of it, people like it. Half the bonus system is based on personal performance. Half the bonus is based on company performance. So at the end of the day, when the balance scorecard is done at the end of the year, people can figure out what half of their bonus is going to be. The other half is based on their portfolio reviews. And quite honestly, between those two, they can figure out themselves how big their bonus is going to be. I have to say, it's been a big advancement. It's seen as very fair. It's seen as very logical. Uh, and it's been well accepted by everybody. The other thing you find with this bonus system is you don't have silos anymore. Okay, You don't have these areas where sales is not concerned with what operations is doing. Operations is not concerned about IT. Finance is somewhere in the middle. Um, I've never seen a tool that's been able to bring more different parts of the company together and get them working in harmony than this has. We were at a manager's meeting where it went from, you know, sales isn't doing their job, operations isn't doing theirs, to operations looking at sales and going, what can we do to help you? And I have to say, that was a big mindset change. And those are the types of things that can really foster a good working environment. I have to say, the soft skills and these soft pieces are extremely important. You want to have a place where people like to come to work every day. You want to have an office environment where people are working together to achieve common goals rather than trying to do everything just for themselves. And that makes a big and varied difference in what's going on in the world. The other part about international business is you will meet some fantastic people. You will have experiences that you never could have imagined. The people that I have met, the connections that I have made, I think are things that I treasure. You absolutely meet some fantastic people and you have some wonderful experiences. You also meet some jerks along the way, but I think that's a pretty constant all over the world and you can find them here at home as well. Um, I think as far as what it does do for you, I think it, doing international assignments makes you more tolerant. It makes you more patient. You know, you get into situations where not only are you the only American in an environment, but you may be the only Westerner in China in this environment as well. And you start to look at things a lot differently. When you're in the US, you're never, or you're very rarely put into those situations. And when you're doing business internationally, it becomes more of a normal occurrence. And it can be extremely rewarding. I've seen places, I've gone to travel to areas where people have taken their own time because they want to show me their city. They're very proud of where they're at. And these are experiences that you would not have otherwise. And it can be fantastic. The one thing I will say is it can also be very uncomfortable. You have to step very much outside of your comfort zone to be able to go and do these things. It's not fun at times. It can make you very nervous. You're very outside of your norm. And you have to step outside of your shell to go and do these things. And in the end, it all works out. It's all fine. But the anticipation can be worse than the actual experience. You know, growing up in Mishawaka, Indiana, you know, I never imagined I'd be down in Beijing, China, or over in Shenzhen or Hong Kong and doing business in these areas. Um, but I have to say, the world is becoming more global. And you're going to have to get more involved in these situations and step out a little bit. And that's the environment that you're working in today. 
you know, it, the world is changing. It's becoming more global. And regardless of what area of business you're going to work in, you're probably going to be interacting with people on an international basis in some way, shape, or form. And those relationships and how you deal with those people is going to determine whether you succeed or fail. So really, you know, in the end, it comes down to having a brain. You have to put yourself out there. You have to use it. You have to be very open to new ideas. And you're going to have to get your problem-solving skills out. As far as the courage, you know, the glamour stops when you step off that plane. And you're going to be put in situations where you're going to have to step up to the plate and really step outside of your comfort zone. As far as the heart, you really have to love people. You have to love what you're doing. Otherwise, it's going to show. And people are going to pick up on it extremely quickly. The one thing I did want to show you all, that's pretty much coming to the end on this. First of all, Notre Dame has a world-class business program. I don't care where you go and where you do business, what you learn here will serve you very, very well. Notre Dame Club in Beijing is very active, and I have to say well represented overseas. I was involved with the Notre Dame Club in Europe as well. You meet some fantastic people worldwide. And you do have a lot in common, no matter what class you graduated in, but there is a common bond. And people around the world respect the school. As far as stepping outside of your box, take a class in something that's not maybe your norm or your comfort zone. For me, it was philosophy. I ended up going and studying philosophy overseas. But that ability to be able to think outside the box and come up with creative solutions will serve you very well throughout your career. Take a foreign language. Don't be the stereotypical American, OK? When you're doing business internationally, if you are fluent in another language, it earns you bonus points. It doesn't matter which language it is. Just learn another one. It really builds credibility. As far as entrepreneurship, let's be honest. South Bend is in Silicon Valley, right? But right next door in Elkhart, Indiana, this was the Silicon Valley of the 60s and 70s. These people, entrepreneurs, build up extremely successful businesses in the RV and boating industries. The amount of wealth that was generated over there is incredible. These people over there, and one of them is a very big sponsor of Notre Dame, Arthur J. Dicio, I think they would love to probably talk to some students if anybody approached them. But you could learn a heck of a lot from those guys. You know, I hear from some people, well, we're not at Stanford, we're not near Silicon Valley. You know what, the principles of building a successful business are the same. It can be a different industry, but take advantage of it. You know, the other thing is the most successful entrepreneurs in the world are Amish. The success rate of Amish businesses is one of the highest in the world. You're in Amish country. There was even a book uh, written recently about the success of Amish entrepreneurs. And it may seem a little odd, but there's something to learn from that as well. Two other things that I would highly recommend as far as your ability to connect with people, some of the courses that I've taken. Dale Carnegie, it's time tested, well worn, but uh, how to win friends and influence people. Your ability to connect with others is everything. I have met some of the brightest people in the world, but they could not connect with other people. And at that point, they fall down. They are not successful. Part of being successful is being able to get your idea across and sell your ideas. And this part is extremely important. The other one is the seven habits of highly effective people. It's offered right here. I believe it's Kathleen Sullivan that offers it. I took this course back in, I think it was 1999, after I graduated through the Alumni Association. It was fantastic. Biggest thing you learn is to write down your goals. This, the old title slide. I have to say we are pretty proud of this one. And with this, I think we'll end it. But this is the new BMW concept car called the Vision. It's pretty cool. It has the performance of an M3. It will do 0 to 60 in 4.8 seconds. It has better fuel economy and lower carbon emissions than a Toyota Prius. All the components in this car are technology that, are, that is available today. 
You're seeing this as kind of a test bed for some of the other products we brought to market, like the Hybrid 7, the Hybrid X6. BMW is number one in sustainability as an automaker, as, as recognized by JD Power. But from the design of our cars all the way through the production and to the resale of them, BMW is very much in tune with sustainability. Our motors, not only the new engines, are they 25% more powerful, but they're also 25% more efficient. This car, we adapted it, and what you see as the background is actually a Peking Opera Mask. And I think our creative agency did a fantastic job of taking this concept car and tailoring the message to the local market. So that's something that you probably will not see over here. So. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. It's been fun to be with you. Kirk has offered to uh, entertain some questions. We have microphones here. We would like you to come right up to the mic and ask your questions so we can record it. So please uh, just go up. You can line up at either microphone. We've got one on both sides. Uh, while in China, did you have to deal with any ethical issues with... Uh, both with the car becoming vilified in the public eye and um, selling cars in a country that is suffering from extreme pollution and um, a lack of infrastructure to handle the cars? Well, as far as the infrastructure, I will say that it's probably the main difference between India and China. China is building the infrastructure. India does not have the infrastructure. China, in the past year, built more new roads than exist in total in Germany. So from an infrastructure standpoint, they are really focusing on it. From an environmental standpoint, I have to say the Chinese are doing a little bit more than what other governments are doing. But once vehicles hit a certain age in China, they have to be scrapped. And in that way, they are improving the emissions and uh, quality of vehicles that are on the road. One thing, some other things to keep in mind is government regulation can really tailor what happens on an environmental standpoint. You know, I think 10 years ago, you saw Beijing dotted with either bikes or two-cycle mopeds. The government went to a policy of promoting electric bikes, and mainly what you see on the street today are electric bikes. Uh, I also think that some of the Chinese companies have, an, have the possibility to really make an impact on a global basis with electric vehicles. If you look at BYD, BYD is first and foremost a battery maker. They also happen to make cars. But batteries are very, obviously, very integral to the electric vehicles. And I think out of any of the electric startups today, they have, a, they have the opportunity to make an impact worldwide. Uh, as far as the, you know, the climate over there, I have to say there are days where it can be pretty bad. Um, but it's not only a matter of the number of vehicles on the road. You have a lot of it that comes from the industrial side, too. You have uh, a, you know, an economy that is exploding so fast they can't keep up with the power generation. So what you will see are non-licensed coal-burning power plants spring up, and those contribute a lot to the pollution of the environment. But I have to say, in a lot of respects, I think China is, is doing more than some of the Western countries. But they're still trying to get it right, and they have to deal with the growth as well. OK, do we have another question? Please. My name is Ross. I'm a one-year MBA here. Um, I was wondering, you stress the importance of emerging markets, and clearly China is uh, right now for BMW the future. But I was wondering what you guys have done to position yourself for places like Brazil and India that are expected to grow like China has. Yeah, I, you know, everybody talks about the BRIC markets. So you have Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Um, India doesn't have the infrastructure yet. I think this year in India we may sell about 4,000 vehicles. In China this year, we've already sold close to 90,000. So that's the difference in the markets there. If you go to India, you know, the infrastructure just isn't there yet. Um, Brazil, you know, we're present there as well, but nowhere on the scale of, of where um, China is. Russia would probably be right behind China, but, you know, sales there are a lot less as well. But, you know, you get into the market early and you start, I think it comes back to this principle of, of taking global values and principles, but tailoring them to the local market. So the things that we've done in China, such as the long wheelbase 5 series, some of the creative work that you see, you'll see that applied in the other markets as well. 
You have another question, please. Sure. Um, we do both wholesale and re retail financing. So uh, the wholesale side would be, I would say, small-scale commercial lending. So we're lending to the dealers. It could be for facilities. It could be for inventory financing. You know, in dealerships, the, the biggest expense that you have is really your inventory. It ties up a lot of working capital. So to be able to do revolving lines uh, for inventory financing is pretty big for our dealers. Uh, most of the dealers in China are independent business people, so working capital is near and dear to them. Uh, so we work on that, on that range. And then the other side of the business is exactly what you mentioned, is on the retail side. Um, you know, China, what you see right now is the acceptance of financing is, is varied quite dramatically. I think in our portfolio, I would say 75% of our finance customers are under the age of 35. The other 25% probably range in age from 35 to 45. I don't believe we have anybody in the portfolio that's over the age of 45. So I think there's a couple things that are going to happen in China. I think number one, uh, demographically, the acceptance of financing as a way to buy a vehicle is going to grow. You know, in the U.S. right now, it's about 80%, and China is nowhere near that. And number two, you're going to see more sophisticated financial products come into the market. You know, we introduced a balloon loan couple of years ago, which was considered an exotic product. Um, leasing uh, really hasn't taken off in the market yet. Um, and, you know, over time, I can see that developing as well. So we really do two different types of financing, one kind of a small commercial lending, the other retail focused. You know, there's things that you have to deal with, too, that are different as far as simple things like credit bureaus. If you want to run a credit check on somebody, there's not a long credit history in China. So honestly, in some situations, there are instances where you send somebody physically out to a customer's home to verify their information because there's not a hit in the, in the credit database. And these are the things that you kind of have to work through and do a little bit differently, whereas in the U.S., you would simply re rely mainly on your credit scorecards. The other item that we do differently is that we have finance and insurance managers in a lot of the dealerships. So they're actually meeting the customer in person, but they're employed by us. So that actually becomes an initial part of the credit check. Um, so, you know, it's one of those things. The principles are the same, but how you apply them, you have to tailor to the local market and deal with them. But I have to say, if you look at the Chinese customer, they're very good credit quality. The delinquencies are very low. I would say probably 95% are homeowners. And if you look at the savings rate in China, you know, the savings rate is around 50%. In the U.S., it just recently dramatically increased to 6%. Um, so there's a big difference there. Do we have another question? Well, while they're thinking, uh, would you talk a little bit about intellectual property rights? Uh, we, we've heard a lot of stories, read them in the news, uh, both from a personal and, and business aspect. Yeah, as far as intellectual property rights, you know, China is very much an emerging market in that sense, and they're grappling with the issue. Um, you know, we've had some instances where there has been a vehicle called the CEO that looks a lot like a BMW X5 locally produced, and that was an issue we had to deal with. Uh, if you look at the company called BYD, if you look at their logo, it's a, it's a circle, blue and white in color, with the three letters BYD on it. So you run into those items, uh, you know, on a, on a professional basis, you know, and on a personal basis. You know, honestly, I, I, you know, as far as pirated DVDs and things like that, um, you know, I honestly don't know where I could buy a legal DVD in China at this point. Um, and it's just, you know, as long as you don't take them out of the country, you're, you're fine. And those shops get shut down on a regular basis. But, you know, that's an issue that they're grappling with. But I have to say, I think they're becoming better and better about it. I think... Uh, you know, going into the WTO and membership there has certainly um, advanced some of the the legislation around it and also the enforcement around it. So I know there are a lot of stories about it, but it is improving, and I think the government's doing a good job with it. Okay, Kirk, thank you very much. Thank you, sir.
Kirk has, uh, Kirk has offered to stay here for a few moments, so if you'd like to come up and ask a question afterwards, please feel free. Thank you very much. Remember, our next presentation is tomorrow at 1040, right here. Thank you.